there's a possibility that someday in the future, aliens will come to Earth and discover that not only did humans exist, but that they wore big red boots made of thermoplastic polyurethane and ethylene vinyl acetate foam. And to be fair, they wouldn't even be wrong. But what they won't find is a pair of giant red boots made out of wool. Because it'll be a sunny day in the UK before aliens get to judge me for my project choices. So let's get started, shall we? For this project, I'll be using an Aaron Waite wool in the reddest of reds. Technically, there are multiple ways of constructing a boot, and this one was no exception, but I chose the bottom-up, or should I say bottom-up, approach. That might actually be the worst one to date. Basically, I needed an oval of some sort, and having never crocheted one before, let's just say that little did I know how lofty a pursuit this would be. My first two attempts were abysmal, to put it lightly, and were reminiscent of things other than an oval. The very first shape was made by naively adding increases on either end of a chained round, and the second was a more realistic and methodical approach with multiple increases, but it just looked too uneven for my liking. So I tried again, this time with more even spacing. So here are the attempts that I have left. Um, obviously this is my first one, and this is my third one. I frogged the middle one. And I think I'm done with crocheting in the round. The original is more of a rounded oval, and this is quite a straight one. So, uh... I think what I will do now is I'm going to work flat, and that way I can actually get a proper ripped effect, because in the round, it just doesn't give the same texture. But before I could get started, I needed some sort of template. And I had the foresight to get some EVA foam sheeting, the same type of foam used in the original, because I thought it might help to maintain the shape of the sole. So hopefully I can use this as a template to crochet against. In hindsight, I could and probably should have just used paper to be on the safe side, but there are few things as satisfying as cutting foam sheeting, and I just couldn't help myself. Once the template was cut, I started crocheting again, and this time working in the back loop was finally giving the rib effect that I wanted all along. However, despite ticking so many boxes, all was rotten in the state of affairs. Okay, maybe that's an exaggeration. So here's my progress so far, I think it's looking okay. I did try and fill in this gap with a shorter chain, but honestly it just didn't work out well, and it ended up looking like this. And that's because the tension of the chain was just too tight. So I'm hoping I can fill this in later, but we'll have to see. It's pretty stretchy, so it should fit anyway. Again, the ideal oval was escaping me, and despite having done so much already, the reminder that I'd barely even started was slowly getting to me. But as my fictional grandmother used to say, when in doubt, get the short rows out, or rather in, which would make more literal sense. It actually looks like both of these are okay, so I think I'll just continue with this one. Sure, they weren't perfect, and judging from my other attempt, it may not have even been worth it, but they were done, and they did exactly what they were meant to do. That being said, there was still a part of me that just couldn't let go of the idea of a superior rib, so I swatched a knit-like rib to see if it was any better, and honestly, it kind of was, but also wasn't. Visually, I preferred the new one, but texturally, the old one felt better. And I guess that's the moral of the story, which could also be applied to absolutely anything, including people. Eventually, I matched the template to a point that seemed close enough. I then needed to start working upwards, which meant establishing the round along the entire edge of the sole. So with the rest of the yarn, I basically started to neaten up the edges with single crochets, and it basically stopped here. And the end of the round is this marker here. So close. Yet so far. Uh -oh. The urge to end up with a quote good number of stitches, i.e. a number that was divisible by something, was intense. So here's the current progress so far, and don't get me wrong, I think it's looking okay, but something just feels a little off. Establishing the round added an extra width that I hadn't factored in, and although it probably wasn't the biggest of deals, there were also other things I wanted to change. For example, I felt like the ribbing could have been neater. So I think that now is probably the best time to change them, because otherwise it's going to be too late. And in some ways, it already is, because this part here took forever. 
so to distract us from the ever-looming dread of repeating it all over again but only slightly better, let's explore the appeal of the big red boots that inspired this project. Mischief, the art collective responsible for their creation, describes them as cartoon boots for a 3D world, and that cartoonishness is an abstraction that frees us from the constraints of reality. If you kick someone in these boots, they go boing. This is nothing new for the brand, having made a name in pop culture through their highly referential and sometimes controversial designs. But what makes these red boots stand out so much compared to their other releases? One could ask why Clifford was a big red dog and not a normal shoe, but I'm not sure how far we'd get with that. My best guess is that beyond the obvious regressive experience this design promises to the wearer, the silhouette and proportion of these boots is physically transformative. Walking in them is virtually world-changing, from our muted and worn-out reality to the cartoon wonderlands of our childhood shows and video games. Despite having no desire to have the original article myself, the shape and proportions still do something for me. Perhaps it's simply the pre-programmed nostalgia, more specifically the constant wondering as a child about why real life didn't look like the cartoons, instead of the other way around. Not to mention the constant what-ifs, and longing for it all to be real. My second attempt at obtaining a soul in the material rather than spiritual sense turned out to be more successful, however I was a little perturbed by just how different they were. Despite the red oval flags waving in my face, I was pretty dead set on staying with this one, and proceeded by working upwards in the round. It did look pretty dodgy for a while, but since that was also the case with the first try, I didn't think too much of it. So this is the first one, and this is the second attempt, and you can kind of already see there's a difference, although I should add that when it comes to this middle section, there's only a two stitch difference in width, but I also think that I probably tightened my tension for this one, which would make a lot more sense. But yeah, I'm pretty excited, and I think I'm on the right track. The next potentially catastrophic concern was the twisting of the stitches. You may or may not have already seen some of my previous crochet projects for which I used the half double crochet waistcoat stitch, which remains my favourite crochet stitch. Part of the reason why is because there's barely, if any, warping when working in the round. Unfortunately, the same cannot be said for the single crochet version, which, as you can see, was leaning harder than a buffet spread at a bodybuilding competition. But the weirdest part was that depending on how I held it, it sometimes looked vertical enough for things to work out, and I was leaning more towards just finding out, hopefully without all the frogging around. So now I'm going to start making some decreases. I didn't have the will to faff around with any of the extra techniques for getting straight rounds, so they were a no-go for me. Technically, the Vs of each stitch were stacked on top of each other, unlike the slightly diagonally worked single crochet stitch, so in theory, it should have been okay. What didn't seem okay was a cannibalistic sacrifice happening before my very eyes, my current project devouring the former, but I guess it's okay when it's only yarn, which if we're still being technical, is very much a protein, and therefore keto friendly? <gasps> this is a joke. If you're sensing the big red elephant in the room, fear not. There was a reason for using the waistcoat stitch instead of the single crochet stitch. Since I planned on turning these boots into plush winter slippers, the waistcoat stitch made for a relatively impenetrable fabric to hold in the stuffing. Not only that, but in my experience, it also tends to hold its structure pretty well, twists less in the round, as we just covered, and also on a very superficial level, looks like knit fabric. And I had a feeling that this would come in handy later on. I added the decreases symmetrically and things were going well, apart from one, or should I say several, huge things. I did consider short rows to create the curved top of the boot, but working back and forth would have changed the entire stockinette pattern, so they weren't really an option at all. The eventual stuffing may or may not help to smooth out the bumps, but at this point in the year, I really had no more frogs to give, so even if the worst case scenario manifested into reality, I was probably too tired to fight it. The base is still the same size, obviously, but because there still isn't much structure, everything is kind of just falling down. Um, Needless to say, it was hard to express exactly how horrifying this was. The only thing that was getting me through it was knowing that it wasn't over yet. It was time to start knitting. Since the idea from the very beginning was to at least partially stuff these boots, I knew I needed a lining of some sort. And this is my first time trying the Turkish cast on. So, fingers crossed it goes okay. 
So I'm going to slip my slip knot on, which I need to remember is not important. I haven't actually calculated how many stitches I'm going to need, so yeah, I should just go and do that first. I think I'm going to go with 12, just to make sure that it's as comfy as possible. So I think it's counterclockwise. And if I learned anything from my knit versus crochet sock experiment, it was that knit socks don't feel like walking on gravel. This isn't meant as a blanket statement, it's just a painfully specific observation of amateur proportions. And then I just... no. I'm meant to get... Have I done it the wrong way? So without too much thought going into how much yarn I actually had left, I used the same red yarn to freehand a sock. Okay, I was sort of right the first time. The great thing about toe-up socks is that you can see how they fit a lot more easily, so the trade-off is more than fair in my opinion. I then tried switching to DPNs way too early, and that was, again, naive of me at best. And unlike holes in a donut shop, there just wasn't enough to go round. For the sock, I just increased until the main circumference, broke the round to knit the heel flap, made some German short rows to turn the heel, and then knit everything in the round again for the ankle. After that was done, I stuffed the outer shoe slightly to give a better idea of the end result, and then inserted the sock inside to see how the knit lined up with the crochet. At this stage, I was still going with the idea of stuffing the lower part of the boot, but not the shaft, since the crochet was relatively sturdy. Everything looked pretty decent, and it definitely restored some of the optimism that had been previously lost, so I decided it was safe to cast off. It looks like the big red elephant is here to stay, because these boots being brought into existence was one thing, but the enormous hype surrounding them was truly on another level, having sold out within minutes of being released earlier this year, and for footwear that, according to the reviews I saw online, doesn't fare too well in functionality, wearability, or affordability with a £280 or $350 price tag, it's hard to not wonder what would drive so many people to buy them, apart from the the obvious hype, but that could just be it. Although to be fair, it's not as if everyone bought a pair. But long story short, you could just say that it is precisely the state of the economy that drove this phenomenon, and that this is simply the spectacle of consumerism in a late-stage capitalist society. And you'd probably be right. Doom spending is a thing, and it's on the rise. Talk about pulling up bootstraps. Oh wait, these boots don't even have any. Whatever will we do? Perhaps planned obsolescence has worn us down so much to the point that we have learned that nothing lasts forever, including our tastes, aspirations, and financial stability. So surely nothing else matters more than the present, and little will prevent us from indulging our deep-seated and insatiable craving for instant, short-term gratification. Trends are a religion, and hedonistically chasing aesthetics is one of the few ways left to find some semblance of salvation, belonging, and a false but mandatory sense of uniqueness, to which wearing hyped-up footwear is an equivalent. I can't even tell if I'm being serious. For some, these big red boots fill the big red boot-shaped hole inside of them, and hopefully it's not as gross as it sounds. The listing for these boots on the Mischief website states the following. The aesthetic Overton window stretches towards the unreal. When half the sneakers we see on social media are renderings, we end up chasing supernormal stimuli. We come to expect a baseline of unreality. And if I'm honest, the conceptual self-awareness makes me feel a little better and a little worse. It gives a sense of, the world is ending, but we get it, so join the club. You only have to ride the hype train to get there, and in doing so, perpetually the very cycle that led to this dystopia, a truly flawless business model. Sometimes it feels like irony will never go out of style, and maybe it shouldn't. What we seem to have accepted at the end of the day is that real, real bad, but unreal, real good. As an art piece, I can appreciate these boots for their commentary. As an actual commercial item, again, the appeal isn't quite there for me personally, and some of that has to do with the consumer irony, but also the alleged lack of wearability. But I have to say that making my own plush project inspired by them was proving to be an exercise in something. In what exactly, I still wasn't sure of, beyond the technical aspects. For me, the appeal of crocheting oversized boots is more to do with comfort than looking cold cartoon-like. At risk of oversharing, this yarn was initially meant for a completely unrelated project that I have no desire to make anymore, so this was a way of using it up. 
Perhaps this is all a little too honest, and perhaps that takes away from the magic, but it's the truth. And this truth may make anyone who wanted or actually bought these plastic boots recoil in consumerist horror. Or it may not. Nothing truly matters anymore when you're crocheting a pair of giant cartoon boots. Multiple rounds later, things weren't looking as promising as I hoped they would. Okay, this isn't great. Although the boot could stand on its own, and probably more so after being filled, it wasn't straight and I wasn't feeling confident about it staying upright. And unfortunately, I am quickly running out of yarn. So what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to switch out the red for the sock for something that probably won't transfer as much, and hopefully I can then use this yarn to finish off the top. Because currently, I have about maybe 30 grams left, and that's been quite generous. The boot is supposed to be much longer than this, and in terms of all the rippling slash buckling, honestly, I'm just too far gone now, so I'm definitely not going to be frogging anymore. So if it turns out to look really strange, at least they'll both look strange together. I think as well as it holds up right now, that won't necessarily be the case in a couple of months time, um, especially with the twisting. So to be on the safe side, I think I'm going to make a double layer and stuff the sides as well. For the sock, I think I'm going to change to maybe an off-white, simply because I think that will be the safest option. And that way I won't have to worry too much about this red ruining my clothes, because um, the transfer onto my workspace is pretty bad at the moment, and every time I try to wipe it clean, the dye does come off, which is a good sign, but that also means that it's basically rubbing off on everything, so although it might be a little painful now, I think it will be worth it. For the new socks, I intended on using an off-white wool that I thought I had but couldn't find, so I settled for an iron weight acrylic meant for a different project. But I think this actually might work out better because now the lining of the sock is a lot smoother, and I'm hoping this will make it easier to put on and take off. And sure, the copium had inevitably set in, since I really had my heart set on wool, but the acrylic version was pretty much the same. And then, it happened. I found the wool. Of course, I was hesitant to start all over again, but it turned out that I had less of the acrylic than I thought, and really didn't want to potentially sacrifice a future project for a sock lining. So that was that. I was starting over. This was my third sock going on to my fourth, but at this point I had mastered the art of toe-up sock knitting, so in a way there wasn't too much to complain about. In case we could even forget, knitting with the heavier yarn made life so much easier, and it was at this precise point that I realised that I hadn't used an iron weight yarn since last year, and that really put things into perspective. Because it turns out that the fabric of space and time is really mostly knit and only sometimes crocheted. Now I seized this opportunity to do something I've wanted to try since my first ever sock video, and that was to knit both socks at the same time, which sounded like alternate reality madness at the beginning of this year, and kind of still did, but soon enough it made sense and was, in this reality, very straightforward. Because each sock had its own ball of yarn, and the technique was just switching between the top and bottom sides using the magic loop method with the cable. The main difference with starting was that I had to use Judy's magic cast on instead of the Turkish one, but they were similar enough. We've all heard the term late-stage capitalism thrown around within the context of things suck right now because capitalism, and this is exactly how I used it earlier, but with the intention of actually connecting the dots, I tried to look for a better sounding definition, but soon came to realise that that was pretty much it. It's difficult to say whether the big red boots are a perpetuator or merely a symptom of the current climate, and it might just be a case of two things being true at once. Heck, they're basically the same thing. There is no ethical consumption under capitalism, and how dare anyone suggest that we can't have fun? Alternatively, you could just see them as something fun, and fun things have always existed and will only continue to, hopefully. And I'd prefer to go with this option if it wasn't for all the cynicism brought about by, that's right, the C word. To be clear, I think these boots are F-U-N, and a significant proportion of that might just be at our expense, but like, something about laughing at yourself just hits, and sometimes hurts, different. When it comes to the aesthetics of the boots, the contrast between the bold silhouette and colour compared to the realism of our bodies, the rest of our wardrobes, and not to mention our environments, is, for lack of a better term, jarring. If anything, the dissonance adds to the concept, but hear me out. 
out. Cartoon boots aren't made out of plastic and foam with real material impact in a real material world where real material go- The point I'm trying to make is that cartoon boots are just boots. And weirdly enough, the unreal, real-life ones are still a little too real for me. Making plushy boots, however, might just be my attempt at softening this dichotomy. After all, a teddy bear is neither an attempt at a real nor unreal bear. It is merely a cuddly symbol for bear. And if all goes well, this project might just end up being a cozy symbol for boot. So here's hoping. Anyway, everything was going surprisingly smoothly until I reached the German short rows and things got messy. So I removed one of the socks and completed the last set of German short rows to turn the heel of the second sock. I then reunited both socks onto the cable and genuinely thought that it would be the last of it, but of course it wasn't. What I soon realised was that this method probably worked best for sock weight yarns, because the work likely wouldn't slide around as much when the needle and cable are a similar size. After separating the socks onto different needles, I finished them separately, adding much more length to them so that they would line each boot leg. The socks were also to be turned inside out so that only the stockinette is visible from the inside of the boot. Remember when I tried explaining why the waistcoat stitch was going to prove useful in the end? Well, here it is. To finish the outer boot with the rounded edge, I decided to knit because it was stretchier and looked a whole lot better than the wrong side of the crochet. In hindsight, it might have been better if I just continued with the waistcoat stitch by working upwards and then closing everything up along the top edge, but not only did knitting seem easier on my hands at the time, it was also a subconscious cope to further justify choosing the waistcoat stitch in the first place. I ended up adding some shaping as well because I didn't want to deal with the filling showing or poking through the knit since it was a lot thinner than the crochet. It did take away from how neat it looked, but it wasn't like it was hideous. To me, anyway. Realistically, I wasn't going to unravel it and start again, so I was sticking with it. And despite feeling like I had conquered the big red beast, I quickly remembered that I still had another one to go. I won't bore you with the duplicate details, so here's one I made later. I also washed and soaked them to get rid of as much excess colour as possible, but I'm not sure if it did enough. Anyway, all I had left to do was to cut out more of the foam sheeting using the original template, Test out the stitching. This will work. Stitch the foam pieces together to create a sturdier sole. Turn the boots inside out. Stitch foam onto wrong side of each boot. Stitch the knit tops into the crochet to create a seamless finish. Stuff edging with pillow fluff where all dreams go to die. Finish stitching up edges, enthusiastically fill each boot to get rid of any and all creases, place socks inside of boots, and alternate between stitching and stuffing, which is also a euphemism for crafting with snacks. And that was it. I don't think I could have ever imagined they would be this large, despite that being one of the key features but they are very comfortable as a result, and kind of feel like walking on clouds in a sleeping bag. They're also a lot cuter than I expected, and as predicted, they are fun, if I'm honest. I'm still not sure how I feel about them, and that's because they're just so ridiculous. Would I prefer them smaller? Sure. In a different colour? Definitely. Do I care that they're essentially a long-winded take on a short viral moment from this year? Only in the sense that that's exactly what they are. Will I care if aliens do end up finding them? Maybe. What does all of this mean on a deeper, more intellectual level, worthy of a video essay conclusion? Well, I've learned that these boots might not be made for walking, but that's just what they'll do. Thank you so much for watching, I'll see you in the next one.